Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the World Economic Forum's panel debate on the global debt dilemma. Um, first, I regret to inform you that um, the governor of the Central Bank of the Russian Federation, um, Governor Nabulina, um, is unable to be here. And um, also, unfortunately, um, Professor Justin Lin from Peking University um, is unable to attend as well. He's a little under the weather. Um, having said that, that gives us even more time with these three very distinguished, very esteemed, and very interesting panelists. Um, so I'm delighted that um, these three are here, and, and thank you very, very much for coming. To my immediate left is Argentina's newly appointed finance minister, Alfonso Pratt Gay. To his left is Kenneth Rogan, Rogoff, excuse me, um, who of course is a professor of Harvard who's written um, extensively and eloquently about global debt for many, many years. And um, to his left is um, Barry Gosen, who is the chief executive officer of one of the largest commercial real estate companies in the world, uh, Newmark, Grubb, Knight, and Frank. Um, obviously, global debt is an issue that all of us um, contemplate, think about, wonder about um, constantly. It's always surprising to me that um, this is an issue that we wrestle with for centuries and centuries, and we never seem to be able to figure out when it's going to uh, sort of reach out and, and grab us um, like it did in 2008. And it seems to come from unexpected quarters and unexpected sources. Um, it never seems to go away, and it's almost impossible to optimize. Um, right now, we're talking about um, SOEs in China. We're talking about student debt. We're talking about emerging market debt. Um, and yet, we, we still don't know um, where the real trouble spots are. And so um, I think that I'd like to start with, with Professor Rogoff um, and Ken, because you've written so much about this, and, and get your take on, on the situation just sort of from a very macro and historical perspective. Where do we stand right now in terms of global debt, leverage in the system, and how do we know if we're at a danger point? Well, I think the most important thing to say is debt is a piece of a larger picture. Debt crises don't happen out of nowhere. You know, typically there's a big growth story that's a good one, and at some point there's too much leverage in the system, and the growth story starts to fade, the leverage seems too much, you know, et cetera. So uh, there are many things going on in the global economy. But I'd say broadly where we are, as I can think, you can think we've been through what I would describe as a debt super cycle that started in the US, focused on the subprime and reaching out. It morphed to Europe, which was obviously an unusual situation of the dysfunction in the European, uh, the Eurozone of not being a full uh, union. And of course, the emerging markets uh, up to that point had the best recession they had. They uh, really had a great recovery very much on the back of China's growth, raising uh, commodity prices that was sort of a big boost to the whole world. But that growth in China, especially after 2008, was very much fueled by a big run up in government credit. You can see it where you know it was moving pretty fast and then it really shoots up and uh, you know, after uh, five or six years has reached a much higher point, six or seven years, reached a much higher point than it would have been otherwise. And OK, does that, does that mean that they're going to have a collapse in debt like we did in China? It's very different. The European leg of the debt crisis was different than the US leg of it. The Chinese will be different again. But, but I think, of course, it's making them more reluctant to do the same again. They're, they could, but they already see their problems. Non-performing loans, you know, officially are one and a half percent, but people believe that about as much as the GDP numbers, mm -hmm. and so um, they they know that, and they think maybe we can handle where we are, but call it six percent non-performing loans, eight percent, but if it gets a lot bigger, maybe we couldn't, and if they're reluctant to use credit, of course, that's very important to you know achieving uh, global growth, and I, I would just say. I, w I just want to contrast that against a story 
that my uh, brilliant colleague Larry Summers likes to say that we're in secular stagnation. We mm. might be, meaning, well, it, his meaning has morphed a lot and o over time, but certainly if you interpret it to mean that for a very long run, mm. things aren't going to be good, I, I don't know. I tend to be, uh, I tend to think, you know, eventually there's, after the cloud of this debt super cycle cools, uh, things will be better. I mean, just one final point in the global recovery. I mean, I think the U.S. is recovering, and we hear the stories about the, the U.S. is back in recession. You know, the markets are saying, and the macro da data doesn't show that. And I think the uh, president of the European Central Bank just spoke, saying he doesn't see Europe in that position at all; that they're recovering. The IMF just downgraded its forecast, but not so much for the advanced countries. Where is the problem? It's in emerging markets. I'm, I'm very happy about what's going on in Argentina, mm. by the way. But um, mm. uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, uh, there's China, where we don't quite know what's going on. It's slowed down significantly. Um, lots of issues to be continued. But Russia uh, and the governor uh, of the Central Bank of Russia, I think, did a wonderful job letting the ruble float, because if they hadn't, they would have been in crisis at this point. There is Brazil uh, with huge political problems. These are two countries. Brazil's recession might be its worst in 100 years. So uh, 2016 is a rough year for emerging markets. And that's the concentration of problems. You mentioned student loans. I mean, I think it's an important moral problem and political problem. I don't think this is a, a systemic yeah. problem in the system. Right. We want to be careful to contrast you know, places we use debt where probably we should have a, a more nuanced instrument and cases where debt, you know, blows out the system. Right, securitization, um, for instance, what, what that did coupled with real estate. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about that um, in 2008. Um, well, we talked to, uh, Ken dropped, mentioned emerging markets, so let's continue in that vein. And he tipped his hat to you, uh, <laughs> Minister. So Argentina, just can you give us sort of just a precy um, what was going on so wrong for so many years in Argentina? And what are you looking to address? How are you fixing it? Big question. Well, th thank you, Andy. Uh, it's, first, it's a pleasure for me to be here and you know, to be in this uh, panel with honorable people. Um, it took me 12 years to get back to Davos. My last time here was in 2004. Hmm. Welcome back. I was, uh, I was governor <coughs> of the central bank uh, back then. And um, well, just like you, like you mentioned in, in your question, uh, I believe my country has gone the wrong way uh, pretty much ever since. Uh, we had the resources, uh, both fiscal and, uh, and you know, FX-wise. So basically, this was a story about populism with resources, uh, and it lasted as, as long as you know, the resources lasted. I mean, as simple as that. <laughs> I could you know, speak all day about the last 12 years in Argentina. I don't think that's really the point. Uh, the point is that there's a new government in place that um, in only a month time, we've removed a significant part of the uh, regulations and of the obstacles that were preventing the economy from actually plowing ahead. This is an economy that has barely shown growth over the last four years. Almost no private sector um, labor growth. Uh, there are many areas of the economy that are basically uh, underutilized. And President Macri's uh, commitment is to you know, fix all that in the shortest period of time uh, with an idea of um, you know, one of the main targets of his campaign is to bring Argentina as close as possible to the zero poverty line, uh, which in itself is a massive, uh, ambitious uh, target. Right now, despite the uh, boon of resources that Argentina has enjoyed throughout uh, the previous administration, not only because of terms of trade uh, positive shocks, but also because of a massive uh, tax pressure on the private sector, um, still Argentina is showing poverty rates of around 30%, which uh, is unacceptable. It's immoral. Uh, we are one of the best food producers in the world. We can feed more than 400 million people. And yet there are 10 million people in Argentina that don't make ends uh, meet. So these are the things we'll be working on uh, over the next mandate. And I'm very happy to be part of that uh, adventure uh, going forward. 
just a couple of points on the on the that issue, and mm -hmm. and of course I'm willing to answer questions about Argentina as well, but I don't want to miss the opportunity to give my two cents on on what Ken uh, was talking about from an Argentine perspective. I mean, we are champions of debt, aren't we? You know, uh, we make the headlines uh, because of that. But the paradox right now is that everyone is talking about the trial of the century and Argentina's hold out, you know, stand uh, uh, alone and whatnot. Uh, when you put it in context, uh, it's, you know, the, the claim that we are now negotiating at the New York courts is less than two points of GDP. So You're talking uh, about the Elliott management yeah, absolutely. Uh, litigation, yeah. the hedge so, fund in I New mean, York I mean, it's a small change compared to the 60 points worth of GDP that debt has increased in, in China over the last three or four years. You know? So first message there is let's put things in context. Second message is uh, we, um, we in, within our first month in office, We've come to the table, uh, we've sat down with the mediator. Uh, we want to put an offer on the table. Uh, we wanted to do that actually next week. There were some logistic problems, whatever that means, on the other side. So we will have to wait until uh, the following week. Uh, but we're eager to put this thing behind, basically, in fair terms, right. of course. All right, I want to drill down. Uh into that issue a little bit more, but I do want to get a, do, Ken, you have a, you have I a just make one, Tim yeah. Ander, uh, many people think of Argentina as the debt champion, and I'm sorry to say you're not. Uh, Venezuela, for example, has defaulted <laughs> far more often. However, you do it with great flair. <laughs> wow, okay. May, may I make a general point on, yeah. the, on, on the debt issue? I think, you know, just to, to lay the, the groundworks of the, uh, of the discussion. Uh, what's different this time in emerging markets um, a few things. First thing is that it's, it's a lot more corporate and household debt that's gone up uh, rather than public debt. And it's a, mod, it's a lot more domestic rather than external debt. So in that regard, it's a completely different animal from the historical emerging market perspective that has been so well documented by Ken along the years. That's the reason why you're not seeing balance of payment crisis um, mm. in the emerging market world, despite the fact that commodity prices have collapsed. Um, the benefit and the beauty of uh, floating exchange rate regimes is something most countries are actually enjoying. We've just joined ourselves because, uh, you know, Argentina uh, has had for the last 10 years or so more or less a fixed peg with very stringent capital yeah. controls, and that, that is something we've removed. But I think it's a very different animal from what we've seen in the, in the, in the last uh, episodes. My uh, thought here would be don't look too much into FX reserves and balance of payments. Look more into the domestic banking system in each country. And this is where I wouldn't be too, uh, too in comfort with what's going on in China. I think, as, right. Ken, as Ken said, we don't have you know, good information about many issues in China. The banking system is the place where we should be looking at. Okay, we'll talk Actually, about China a little bit more. Go ahead, Barry. Argentina has a very low proportion of uh, public and household and corporate debt by comparison to the United States, which is close to 280% of GDP, and Argentina might be 60 to 70? Not even. Percent. I mean, uh, uh, corporate and household debt is less than 20% of GDP. So it's a very under-leveraged economy. See, people know a lot about Argentina, yeah. the economy, these two guys. So that's why I'm talking about But China. it also brings <laughs> the point that the, the, the moniker global debt dilemma, you, know, you can't paint a broad right. brush on global debt because, you know, every crisis is different. And, uh, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, it's, it's oil based, it's currency based, it's bank, government. Uh, I, don't, I don't think you can look at it as a global debt dilemma. You know, what, what's driven the, the cycles have been different in the US. The last cycle, actually most, probably five of the six last cycles were real estate cycles driven by over leverage. Well, let's talk about real estate and that's your area of expertise. And isn't the real estate business rife with leverage? You guys always borrow tons of money, leave us in the lurch, mess up the economy, right? <laughs> Don't look at me. <laughs> uh, I mean, the fact I'm, is, I'm, at the height of the market, there were the, the CMBS market was a $285 billion a year market. Um, today, it's a $90 billion market. 
There is no RMBS market. There is no residential mortgage-backed security market. Uh, there are no CLOs, CDOs. That whole market melted down. The underwriting by banks is a heck of a lot better. The coverage ratios are better. Uh, interest rates help. Um, you know, in fact, if, if you, know, you look at it, it's a leveraged business, but the banks are much healthier. The amount of capital they have is much better. Is, and, this, a, uh, is this a case of regulation working? Uh, well, I mean, for the most part, when you're close to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to a war, you know, you're more frightened of a war. Uh, you know, we're still, you know, we're still very close to what was a terrible meltdown, the, the, the Great Recession. So, so oh, some of it is self-inflicted good stuff, uh, but uh, it should be regulated. And regulations are important, but, um, you know, self-preservation is also important. And I think that the banks have gotten it. A lot of the banks um, are even out of the business. You know, a lot of the, you know, the shadow banking, the, are, a lot of the CMBS uh, business is done through SPEs that have their sort of siloed uh, balance sheets that, that will do a lot of the more riskier loans. The banks are generally do, C, they, when they do single asset securitizations, they're generally backed by credit. So it's, you know, it's a lot smarter, it's a lot better. I don't, I think if you have a, a change in the market, it's likely to be an equity bubble, not a systemic. Uh, if you, you always have bubbles. There'll be bubbles from the beginning of time to the end of time. That's not gonna change. And I'm not sure there's a real definition of bubble, uh, what exactly is a bubble, but, but there, will, there are always corrections. Corrections are also an opportunity. Uh, you know, I look at a, a correction as it could be a great opportunity, a buying opportunity, it's just a correction. Uh, but, um, but I mean, there will be an adjustment and it will be some lost equity. It'll be lost by private equity firms, sovereign wealth funds, some pension funds, which will get it over time. And that's just going to be a big ho-hum. You know, fund nine will not yield the kind of return that they promised the investor. They'll be pissed off for a few months and then they'll give billions of dollars to the, invest, to the, to the private equity firms to buy again. And then they'll hopefully make it back in the next cycle. Okay. I want to ask you about Donald Trump and his use of leverage at some point. Maybe you know a little bit about that. Well, well let's the, start right now. Don, you know, interesting mm -hmm. enough, but Don, what people don't realize about Donald Trump, and, and he is a client of the firm, is Donald Trump, um, on, well, most politicians look at the polls. They look at the negatives and the positives. Uh, but Donald Trump, he, he looks at ratings. So he's more likely to call media people to, to see how his ratings were after a debate than he would call a poll to see what the negatives were, which is a really interesting approach. I mean, um, you know, Donald, if you're going to buy and build real estate business, you, ha you have to, you need leverage to build it. So uh, he, everybody in 1990, when he almost took down Bankers Trust, uh, you know, the, the, when he bought the plaza, there was an article about the Plaza Hotel, and they gave him a $40 million loan uh, on his word, you know, how could you ask me uh, for, you know, for information about my real estate? Uh, uh, I take umbrage to that. Uh, the, but that was, um, so Don, Don, everybody uses leverage at the moment. If, and a lot of real estate just gets done. If, you, if the banks are there and give you the money, you will buy the real estate. So maybe jumping off that point, Ken, how do you know an optimal level of leverage or debt when no. you see it? No, you don't. I mean, I think uh, all you can do is think of debt levels as like cholesterol levels or, you know, weight guidelines. There are, you know, certain levels that historically, you know, or you're at greater risk. You, you can have a cholesterol level, uh, you know, well over 200 and your doctor tells you, you know, I don't think you're going to make it another month and you live for 50 years and you can look great and, you know, you don't. And so uh, I, I just think it's something, you know, you, it, it's a, and, and by the way, data is not very good even in advanced countries. We, the debt comes jumping out of the woodwork. We saw that in the financial crisis, even in the U.S. Um, I, actually, I, I actually, if you don't mind, wanted to ask Barry if real estate's overvalued, because he was talking about equity and well, we just, will lose equity. I yeah, just hosted please. a breakfast. We just launched an, an asset bubble study. We've, we've, we've created an algorithm to look at uh, markets over time, you know, but so uh, anytime you have low interest for a long time, it disguises real asset value. I mean, it has to. Liquidity will drive investment. 
So pricing is high, um, but that doesn't mean, so we, we believe that there is, uh, we, we are close to a peak. The question is, uh, um, what are the factors that you can't predict that delay uh, things from happening? You know, you can't, uh, FERPTA in the US, for example, was eliminated recently. So that will lengthen the ability to invest. Foreign investors will invest more in the United States because they're not taxed as much. So no one could have predicted that. I mean, you know, on, fundamentally, uh, I think the, the real estate market, personally, I would say when people ask me that question, I'm, I'm not a buyer, I'm not a seller. Sort of an equilibrium and depends on your horizon right. of investment over the long term. Right. And uh, I, there were three lessons that my partner's father yeah. had taught me when buying real estate. Very said, um, don't sign personally, don't cross collateralize, and if you live long enough, it'll be worth a lot of money. It works, okay, we're all gonna get in the business. Um, Minister uh, Pratt Gay, I wanna ask you a little bit more about this situation with Elliott Management, just to give people some background. So this is a hedge fund in New York where they bought a bunch of Argentine bonds, and then there was a question of whether they were gonna get paid back or not, and then they have sued the country of Argentina saying they want everything back. That is a, a very simplistic description. Um, are you in a position to say that you're paying them back at a certain level, you know, cents on the dollar? How are you resolving this issue with them? What's the plan? Well, background, some background information for everyone in, in the room and everyone watching us uh, to take away. Um, what's, uh, what's fair value? Uh, that's a difficult question. What's uh, original value and what's face value? Uh, right now, the um, litigants have won uh, their, um, their lawsuit in the court, um, NML and, uh, and Elliot, but there are also you know, some Me Too's mm -hmm. that right. basically won um, a lawsuit against Argentina on a Paris Passu clause. What the Paris Passu clause means is that all creditors need to be treated equally. Um, and therefore, uh, right now, the situation that we've got is that even if Argentina has restructured its 93% uh, of its original debt that, defaulted, that was defaulted in 2001, 7% um, of that debt, the holdouts, uh, are basically, um, well, with this uh, injuncture at the, uh, at the uh, New York courts, are impeding Argentina to be current with that 93% of the bondholders who uh, accepted the deal. The deal that Argentina offered in uh, 2005 and, and again in 2010 is now worth how much would you say on the original uh, capital? I have no idea. I'm sorry. I, <laughs> Make I a wouldn't guess. venture to Make guess. Make a guess. I'm going to be you the mean moderator. cents on the dollar? Yeah. 78 cents on the dollar. It's above 100, it's around 120. Well, why wouldn't they take that? Well, they asked for 350. Oh, that's why. But see, we need to be clear about these numbers because otherwise it's, it looks as if Argentina doesn't want to pay what they owe and they should pay uh, the full amount. There are some bonds in the, um, in the arsenal of bonds that Argentina issued during the 90s. Uh, more than 150 uh, bonds were actually defaulted. They're different bonds, of course, um, but there are bonds that had a very particular accrual interest rate mechanism. Uh, and when I say mm -hmm. particular, is annual rates of 80% per annum. Eight zero. Eight zero. So while the litigants were seeking for justice, fair enough, in the court, they were sitting on a very juicy, um, you know, 60, 70, 80% per annum accrual interest rate, um, just on the basis of uh, these were floating rate notes that would adjust for uh, Argentina's country risk. Uh, Argentina's country risk, of course, we didn't know what it was because there was no market for most of these bonds. But someone was actually writing down you know, a country risk uh, rate somewhere, and, uh, and that was embedded into the contract. So there, for some cases, when you look at the claim, the claim is worth 10 cents on the dollar for the original capital, 90 cents on the dollar for the interest bill. 
I mean, right. we can go right. over and over again this. My opinion is that we need to discuss whether this is a fair claim or not. And this is all we've said. You know, we've sat to the table, we've said we want to honor the debt. There are 30 cents on this claim that is original capital. We want to go ahead and settle that down. Let's discuss the interest bill. Because I don't think you're going to find, not even in the real estate market, you're going to find a more uh, juicy um, investment over that period. I mean, this claim beats anything over that period of time. Right. And, and therefore, that's the discussion we want to have. Again, Andy, this is just, you know, three points worth of our GDP. Right. Uh, it's really a massive waste of energy, time, and argumentation. We want to put it behind, but we want to put it in fair terms, and we want the world to be aware that it was not true what uh, our previous administration kept saying. It was not true that it was the haircut of the century, 75% mm -hmm. uh, uh, haircut. That was not true. Right. Um, it was not true that, um, that the claim now is equal to 100, the claim is equal to 350. Uh, and I think this will uh, set a precedent for, you know, as, as Barry was saying, bubbles come and go, you know, defaults will, uh, right. ha will have defaults in the future. And I think it's very important for the judicial system in the US and th for the global financial market that we're clear on what's being discussed such that we don't make the same mistakes again going forward. Sounds like you're committed to resolving this. Ken, Absolutely. you wanted to jump in? I would just sort of connect points uh, Barry and the governor uh, were making. I mean, people sometimes ask me, are we still going to have minister. these problems? A oh, minister. Minister. A no. oh, minister. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I was at the IMF in, two th in the early 2000s when he was and governor of the Central the Bank, and I, I, I uh, uh, Apologize for my uh, my mistake, and it's a very happy uh, that you you're the minister. Um, I, the uh, people sometimes ask me if in a, in a, in, a, in a hundred years are we going to still have these problems? And okay, part of me says I hope so, so my book's still selling, <laughs> um, and but, you have a job too. But, <laughs> but um, this time is different. <laughs> <right>. <laughs> but I, you know, I th I think um, one of the problems with an over leveraged system with a system which depends too much on plain vanilla debt, and I want to emphasize plain vanilla debt that's not indexed anything as opposed to equity, is with equity, I think Barry said, you know, it goes down, some people lose some money, they wake up, okay, let's figure out what to do. With debt, uh, too often it's the start of a very long and painful conversation, and that's a big part of what makes it so costly. If somebody could figure out at the outset, you know, what's the right way, okay, you can't pay anymore, what's right, what's fair, those are very loaded terms, it would be far less of a problem. And I mean, obviously the Argentine experience is this in the extreme, although not the most extreme. Um, you know, Russia <laughs> took forever to resolve. Um, so so I, uh, Bob Schiller uh, ha has evangelically advocated having more indexation in debt, uh, of course, the problem is it's hard to get transparent data. It's hard to start the markets. But I do think at some level that has to be you know, where we want to be uh, to have a more equity-driven system and less dependence on leverage. So it's mm -hmm. both about telling people they can't leverage as much, but giving them another way right. to borrow money. We're going to take some questions from the audience in a little bit. But Ken, I wanted to follow up. You mentioned the IMF. And the IMF has said that emerging market debt, recently said emerging market debt, could potentially be the source of the next economic crisis. Are you buying that? And if not, where are the real hot spots, the trouble spots with, with regard to leverage in the system? No, I'm buying that. I okay. mean, I think, uh, uh -huh. I think that's... Uh, can you, can you name some names of countries that are particularly troublesome? Uh, you, you know, you know uh, well, we'll go. Uh, Venezuela is the champion. Yeah, and I never want to bet against the champion. Right. Um, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, um, I, I do think the floating rates is an element which makes it a little harder to understand. And I think, you know, if we go back to the countries which haven't cleanly gone on floating rates, they're experiencing problems. And I think what we'd said to China back in the early 2000s was, you know, why don't you have a more flexible exchange rate? And they would say, why? And we saw. Well, one reason is, you know, things are good now. They might not be so good mm. someday. And they would 
sort of say, okay, professor, that's great. We'll call you, you know, mm. when that happens. But um, that's, a, I think, a big problem in there structurally. I think if the, right now everybody's worried, you know, their exchange rate would devalue, what would it do? If it had a floating exchange rate, you know, it wouldn't have all these loaded questions about why was it going down, what was uh, going on. And so, so the floating rates we have, in, uh, uh, as the minister said, um, you know, that we have in many countries has been a cushion against that, and I think it makes it harder to call. That said, there is a lot of corporate debt, and it didn't seem like a big percent of GDP when my thesis student, Jesse Schrager, was working on it a few years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, he thought it was alarming. Mm -hmm. But of course, the exchange rates have gone down so much that the corporate debt, which is that's in dollars, is now much bigger as a share of income, and uh, you know it's, it seems likely some somebody's going to get into trouble. Gary, oh, go right. ahead. Yeah, Minister. No, ju mm -hmm. I just wanted to make a broader point. I don't know if it's uh, suitable for this discussion or not. But we're talking about debt all the time. I think we should spend some time at central bank debt. Um, because uh, to some extent, at least my view is that this might have been the beginning of, uh, of the cycle we're going through right now. You know, you look at central bank debt, basically money printing over the last six years or so, it's gone up like 30 points worth of global GDP. So that's, mm -hmm. a, that's a massive increase in central bank debt. And we keep talking about household, you know, corporate, public. I think we should focus on central bank debt as well mm -hmm. because you know, this liquidity that has been sort of instilled into the system has created, in my opinion, uh, quite a few distortions um, relative price-wise. Uh, and also it's created uh, a, um, maybe a dilemma uh, for, uh, for most central bankers. You had Mario in the previous session here. Uh, he was uh, the savior of the markets today uh, because yesterday he was very, you know, uh, very committed to keep, you know, issuing euros and so forth. And I think we should also think about that, you know, going forward. Are we on the central bank respirator yeah. such that any time, you know, the market sneezes, these guys will be called in to put out the fire? Um, and if that's the case, maybe since the last um, global recession, not a lot of work has been done with the exception probably of the U.S., to fix things, but rather to, you know, cover them up with uh, massive liquidity, and that massive liquidity, liquidity has gone to the right places in some cases, and maybe to the not so right places in some other cases. So I just wanted to put that question over to my colleagues at the panel. But there, there have been times where, uh, look, the government, the idea of government stepping in and covering debt, you know, into a growth economy, it, you know, that growth can solve a lot of things. We have. Uh, we just haven't had the growth to, to grow around. In the 90s, when the, which was probably the, seemed to be worse in real estate, um, and the RTC took over uh, most of the bad loans in the bad banks, uh, and, and uh, interest rates were, were lowered, it, the banks had time to recover, and, and, and they did this time again, I mean, to, to, for the most part. So, uh, you know, also with respect to debt, I mean, I think it depends on the country, whether it's household or corporate. Uh, you know, the U.S. is a consumer economy. I would suspect that corporate and household debt would have more of an impact in, in a consumer economy than it would be some other kind of economy. And, uh, and, and you know, China, for the most part, it's mostly government debt. Um, so governments can also print, print money and they can tax. So uh, the question is how imminent problems are when the government has the bulk of the debt as a, you know, really a, an op a, a, a pivot point on a meltdown. Professor Rogoff, let me um, shift gears a little bit and ask you about young people, uh, millennials. Um, there's talk about this being a very levered generation. Um, <clears throat> is that the case? And if so, does that concern you? Are there differences, generational differences out there that we should be aware of? Well, actually, I mean, I think the young people actually are very conservative in a lot of ways, but mm -hmm. they've been levered. You're particularly talking about this coming to the student loans and stuff where that's sort of, there's a regulatory change and it's, I, th I think it's, uh, they made it too easy to default before and I think they've made it too hard to default now and that's go certainly going to create a lot of anguish. Um, I, I think if you looked across Europe and the whole world, I don't think you'd see this as the young people being incredibly over leveraged. I have to say, I don't know the numbers at my fingertips. 
And what about crowdsourcing? I mean, is that another potential area that could sort of become problematic? And it's, a, it's an well, area where people can borrow and it's sort of un, unknown, right? Yeah, so the broad point is that the regulators are always trying to you know, fix the system and make it stable, but they're always behind the private sector, which is always innovating. And the innovation's good, because it keeps things going but the regulators don't always uh, uh, follow things. So I, mean, I think crowdsourcing is a positive thing, but right. you could have said that about uh, you know, some of the uh, markets that led to blowing up in 2008 if you'd said it in 1998, but then if you don't keep your eye on them, they can get out of hand. Right. Do we have some questions uh, from the audience at this point? Got one, one over here. So I think just wait for a microphone and then identify yourself, please. <clears throat> Hi, uh, my name is Eddie Tai. I'm a global shaper with the Ho Chi Minh City Hub. I'm also an investor with 500 Startups. Uh, thanks for your time. I want to follow up on this student loan conversation. Uh, obviously, on dollar terms versus global debt, it's small in the US, it's about $1.2 trillion. Mm -hmm. But that's two times the Argentinian GDP, so still pretty large. Good facts at your disposal. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's what Google's for. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, I want to push on the, uh, the, the possibility that actually the, the student debt is actually very uh, cumbersome to the U.S. economy. I mean, we're putting tens of millions of young people, potentially very entrepreneurial and innovative, on, on chains, which I think could reduce economic growth in the medium and long term. So uh, I wonder how you account for that possibility in terms of policy making, in terms of analysis. You want to take that, Ken? I, I mean, I don't have a glib answer to that. I've said it's, there's a moral question here. You, at the, it's like in any debt problem. You want to make it easier to borrow when they needed the money to get through school, <laughs> but you want to be careful you know, not to put yourself in a situation, uh, have people put themselves in a situation where it's difficult to work it out. So um, there's, I think, going to be some kind of political resolution of this going forward, but you know, I don't know where it's going to go. It's a good. It's a good question. I, I just. I, I want to suggest it's more than a. Philip. I, I, I want to suggest it's more than a moral. I have a, I have a comment. I, so when when I went to college, I, I did. A, I had a student loan, and I had scholarships and grants, and the book that I got when I graduated that the coupon said I was this big, that <laughs> mm, I was going to uh -huh. be paying for the rest of my life, and I didn't have a job for a while, and it was very hard for me to pay, and uh, and they defaulted me, um, but. In order to go into business, having a bad credit rating is not a good idea. Um, and they reinstated my loan, and I paid every cent back because I told them, "I'm, I'm going to sign a note. I will pay you back." Um, right. So you know, maybe there are probably some solutions to that. We had another question here, from this gentleman. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Jacob Frankel, uh, J.P. Morgan. Uh, the last question about the student loans and the remarks here about uh, central bank debt and the like suggests that maybe not all debts are the same. And yet when we speak about the debt dilemma, they are all eventually going to the same big ocean and maybe they are tr imp impacting on each other. And I want to come to the analogy that Ken made about the general guidelines about optimal debt and the cholesterol. We also know with the cholesterol level, first of all, of course, the guidelines are changing, but uh, we know that there is also good cholesterol and bad cholesterol, which begs the question that came up almost 30 years ago by the Chancellor of the Exchequer, speaking about good deficit, bad deficit. Should we have a distinction between good debt and bad debt, and how do we go about it? Or maybe we create a system in which the good debt degenerate itself to become bad debt, and we should not draw these distinctions. Well, I mean, sort of the obvious answer to that question is, you know, take the example of infrastructure. If you're borrowing to build infrastructure that's really going to be useful, it's a no-brainer, I mean, especially in this situation. And so, you know, that, that's a case. It's the, pur the purpose of the debt makes sense. You might have made a mistake. You might have had the best intentions, best project, you know, but something changes and it's not a good idea. But I, I mean, you'd still say that was good debt. Uh, on the other hand, if you're China and you're, you know, you've gone through this long credit cycle and uh, your debt levels are very high, 
and you're building infrastructure so that you have further overcapacity in steel and whatever other commodities, that's probably not a good idea. But you know, obviously, a you're, you, you can't just look at the debt. I mean, I started out by saying that. You have to look at the whole picture of what's going on. It's not something in isolation uh, you know, any more than one aspect of your health is. In real estate, that would, they talked a lot about the good, good debt and bad debt and having some separ separation between good debt and bad debt. Uh, in the real estate uh, meltdown, um, you know, the fact that you know, banks have to reserve cash against mark markdowns is a pro-cyclical event. And it's, you know, it's like burning the furniture to keep the house warm. You know, you, there's no market, it's illiquid. Uh, somehow when you have uh, a, you know, a market perception of a decline in value, and as a result, when it gets bad, you have to reserve more uh, capital uh, in an illiquid market. You know, it makes it harder to lend. It slows down the entire economy. So having uh, bad debt or some facility that where it's sort of out of control that the market is perceiving this condition, um, there should be, it would be, I think it would be great to have an opportunity to set aside certain kinds of debt in a, in a, with a capacity to not have to reserve against it in the hope that there is some adjustment because you know, there's nothing you can do when, the, when, a, when an illiquid market gets devalued. All right, just, final word from the minister. Just, just uh, to follow up on, on what's, been, uh, what's, what, what's been said already, thanks for your question, Jacob. My, um, yeah, from my experience as a uh, former central bank governor, um, the sense that I ha have is that debt is never bad until it's really bad, you know. So uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very good that you, we use these opportunities. You were saying as when you're close to the war, you know, this thing. I think global regulation has been too much backward looking uh, into the 2000, 2009 crisis and not so much forward looking into the next crisis. And, and this is something we should uh, take, uh, take home and try to make sure that you know, these things we can prevent, as, um, as uh, Ken was saying, with the cholesterol example. Uh, the problem with the cholesterol example is, as my grandfather used to say, you've got to be in very good shape to go to the doctor, you know? <laughs> but uh, yeah. what can you do? Well, why don't we leave that as the final word? Um, obviously, much more to discuss here, and we will be for many years to come, for better or for worse. So please join me in thanking our panelists, Barry Gosen, Professor Ken Rogoff, and Minister Pratt Gay from Argentina. Thank you all very, very much.